The Rauner administration staffs up, and the Supreme Court gets close to a decision on pensions. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state government, sometimes the federal government, and how it just might affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. We still have the new administration of Bruce Rauner taking hold in Springfield and the rest of the state to discuss many things happening today with me. Uh, experts in the field from Springfield. Uh, Kent Redfield is back, Professor Emeritus of Political Science, University of Illinois Springfield. Welcome back, Kent. Good to be here. Bruce Rushton, reporter with Illinois Times who loves watching things like the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, this and that. Welcome back, Bruce. Thanks for having me. And Andy Maloney, Chicago Daily Law Bulletin, State House Bureau Chief. Welcome back. And, Good to be here. And let's start with you, Andy, uh, because a lot of people in the Springfield area are interested in what's going on with public pensions and the pension plan that the legislature passed in 2013. What's the latest? Right. Well, as we know, the, the case is now uh, at the Supreme Court. Uh, they have not heard oral arguments yet. However, uh, the Supreme Court justices put it on a sort of fast track to get it there uh, quicker than a normal case would sort of proceed. Um, and just today, in fact, we had a, an order from the Supreme Court, the coalition of groups, labor, state worker groups challenging the laws unconstitutional um, had asked for more time to submit their arguments uh, which would have also affected the eventual date of oral arguments uh, however the Supreme Court uh, took the uh, uh, took the task of, of reviewing that and today came out and said uh, we're, we're not going to we're not going to do that be, uh, the reason the plaintiffs the the workers had wanted that in the first place was because there was this whole slew of uh, amicus or friend of the court briefs that some of the outsiders had filed along with the state. Uh, and they needed more time to basically read those arguments. I think it was something like 300, 250 to 300 plus pages of reading they would have had to do. And they said, hey, we need more time to do it. Uh, but the Supreme Court today basically said, we're not going to accept those extra briefs. So therefore, you don't need more time to read them. This right. is. Uh, so, of course, the, the law was passed, which would reduce benefits over time, mm -hmm. reduce the, the increases, the 3% annual increases that retirees get, try to save the state, you know, the cut into that $100 billion right. pension shortfall over a long period of time. And, and if this doesn't, if the Supreme Court goes along with Judge John Bells from Sangamon County Circuit Court and says that law is no good, then there's another big hole in the state budget. Uh, Kent, do you think the big hole is going to be in the state budget after the Supreme Court acts? <laughs> Will they agree with the circuit court? Uh, they certainly are telegraphing that. And, and you know, there was a decision on uh, the state trying to cut back on what the, the state workers thought, retirees thought was a guarantee on health care. And uh, the court uh, six to one ruled that uh, it was part of the pension uh, guarantee and that you couldn't change that. And so that seems to be what people are expecting. And so uh, the legal proceedings would suggest that. It's important for the state, regardless of how the decision comes out, to, to, to get this information. Uh, we have to have a budget by the uh, uh, 1st of July that says, uh, uh, you know, this is how we're going to spend money next year and whether or not we've got that pr pension reforms has an impact on, on how we budget and what the state's costs are going to be. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's good to get it done. Of course, the big issue for the people who are opposed to the law is that the state 1970 constitution says you can't diminish uh, pension benefits that have been given. And in that health care case where many employees mm -hmm. get free, get free health care mm -hmm. for life uh, and the state passed a law to make them pay some premiums, uh, the word from the court was, no, you can't even take that away. So it, that's why it looks like, uh, the, I mean, that's why all of us who are looking, despite the fact that the Attorney General, Bruce, uh, Lisa Madigan, <laughs> says that it's yeah, a crisis, and therefore, and therefore <laughs> that's why we can break what that Constitution says. Your thoughts on that argument? Well, I think it's a, it's a ridiculous argument, <laughs> frankly. I mean, are you, you calling our, our Attorney General ridiculous? Well, you got, you know, you got to play the hand that you're dealt, and she doesn't have a good hand, so you got to say <laughs> something. But, you know, when you look at this Illinois fiscal situation, it's dire, but it's dire as a partly, you know, not entirely, but partly as a byproduct of a ridiculously outdated, 
outmoded uh, a regressive tax system. I mean, you can look at any number of experts that have put out, well, here's how you can raise, you can raise $1.7 billion by taxing retirees. You can raise a billion dollars by taxing uh, 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 food. You can raise another $12 billion by taxing services. And Lisa Madigan's gonna go to the Supreme Court and say, we're tapped? I mean, I just don't see it. All they have to do, really, to counter that argument is to come up with these myriad of academic studies which show and, and have a blueprint for a, a better tax system that can raise more revenue in a more equitable fashion and say, you need to use your police powers. I, I just don't see it, that flying. I mean, the police powers is my back's to the wall and the, ba the back's not to the wall. And a lot of folks who filed these sort of uh, outside briefs, there were constitutional law professors, contracts clause people, they would make arguments sort of saying, well, the Constitution, even some of the strongest, most recognizable constitutional rights aren't sort of always guaranteed. There's always sort of these implicit terms that whether they're overtly specified or not still apply. Uh, for instance, the popularly cited First Amendment restriction on yelling fire in a crowded theater, that's a restriction sort of on free speech. Uh, so they're saying that the pension clause sort of works in this way as well, that uh, overtly, yes, it guarantees that pension benefits won't be diminished or impaired, but the state retains this sort of power to assess the situation and, and, and make changes. Yeah. This, yeah. Ain't, this ain't habeas corpus and this ain't the Civil right. War. Right? But, <laughs> but, but are you, that's the argument. That's but, the but, argument. But, but see, but are, are you predicting, but as you like, said, are you predicting as you like said, these guys? That as, you like as you said, I mean, if you're the plaintiffs, if you're the state workers, it, it's hard to see uh, everything that's happened so far in the legal case breaking any better than it, than it has. You had the right. Kenerva decision, the health care decision that you talked about. Um, even procedurally with this one, the case, I believe the Attorney General wanted it consolidated in Cook County. It's in Sangamon, which there was sort of some variance there, but um, the, the trial court could have also taken more time and actually gone through sort of a longer trial and, you know, looked at evidence and discovered, but uh, Judge Bell sort of ruled sort of right off the bat, this is unconstitutional. Yeah. So, so, are uh, you predicting? I, I would never <laughs> pretend to predict right. you're, what you're the court would the do. Court more than the rest <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it, it certainly seems to be breaking uh, the, right. the workers' way. Okay. Well, you know, Bruce, you talk about all these new taxes that could be imposed. We just had an election in which Bruce Rauner spent $65 million, much of it on advertising, telling people we are taxed too much. We don't want the tax that we even had to stay. And now the state income tax has regressed, you know, gone back some at January 1st creating another few billion at least in a, an annual hole. So how does this get done? We have a Democratic legislature, a Republican governor with kind of an anti-tax feel who also wants to spend more on education, which is another part of the plan. And now we might have this giant pension hole. What happens next? Well, that's what everybody's waiting for. I think that the, this is kind of like the spring tensioning, so to speak, for Rauner unveiling the, whatever grand plan it is that he has, because he hasn't unveiled it very much. I mean, I think the most specific he's gotten, for example, on the area of service taxes is he told the Chicago Tribune during the campaign, oh, $600 million. Yeah. You know, well, that's he that. Put out, he yeah. told everybody he, when he put out his list of potential services mm -hmm. that could be taxed, like lawyers, fees. I don't know. I think, I think he actually took that off. He wanted to yeah. uh, tax uh, corporate jet rentals. Okay, yeah. well, geez, things that you know, won't affect real yeah, people. Yeah, that, yeah, like that's going to make a deep debt. But I mean, it's put up or shut up You're time. You're so cynical. Yeah, well, <laughs> forgive me. But, uh, you know, if I'm cynical, go talk to, Jay, you know, Reverend Meeks. I mean, I think Reverend Meeks has done this whole state a great service by throwing out this $729 okay, million let's, dollar let's just, figure. All right, yeah. Reverend James Meeks, former state Correct. senator, runs a big church south side of Chicago, yeah. uh, was, uh, f I guess he was an independent one in the legislature, mm -hmm. uh, but off, but sided with Bruce Rauner in, in the Correct. Uh, campaign yep. and has now been appointed and sworn in, I guess, as uh, chairman of the State Board, state of, Board education, of Education, Correct. has always wanted education, almost ran against Rod Blagojevich mm -hmm. uh, midterm in 2006, yeah. uh, but then, then backed off when Blagojevich promised him education would get enough money, which didn't happen. So where are we now that he is the State Board of Education chairman? Well, I think myself, I mean, Rauner himself has said that he wants to increase money for education. He hasn't been specific with a price tag. Now Meeks has attached a price tag to it. And what I think is telling is that the Rauner administration has not responded to that. They said today, at least as of this broadcast or this taping, we don't have a reaction to that. So is this guy off the reservation? Is he walking lockstep? We don't know. Uh, Senator Kimberly Lightford said kind of, and you can read between the lines, you know, you can almost hear her going. <laughs> well, she's another Democrat. Correct. Uh, from saying, Maywood. Saying, yeah, he wanted the job. an education advocate. Correct. Everybody's an education advocate. Everybody's an advocate. education advocate uh, until it comes time to right. pay for it. Well, uh, 
Kent, you've been watching this for years. The State Board of Education, in my experience, watching over you know a few decades, they always ask for more than they get. Is that is that normal, or what? How does this oh, y- year any different? It, it's well, in in a sense, them saying this is the money that we need, and it being a figure that's going to be very difficult to get to. That's you know that's business as usual. Seven hundred thirty. Oh, that's a, that's an increase, right? Yes, because they still seven hundred twenty nine. Yeah. Seven, oh, thank yeah. you. And, and <laughs> you're you're. you're <laughs> trying to get up to that adequacy standard that we have is kind of a, a ballpark back of the envelope way of figuring this is about the amount of money that you've got a pretty good chance per student of actually being able to deliver a decent education and, and we all of us fall short of that. What you know what is likely to happen at this point and the governor kind of telegraphed a little bit of it by saying, you know, everybody's going to suffer. We all have to share in the pain or mm-hmm. whatever whatever the right words. You know, you're talking budget cuts and you're talking revenue. I mean, when, it, when you know, if taxes are too high and they need to come down, well, those may have been taxes on income or corporations in terms of income, but we got lots of other places to get revenue. And so, you know, I think we're probably going to starve state government and have some real horror stories to get to the end of this fiscal year, all kind of setting the stage for what people hope is a grand bargain of budget cuts and revenue to kind of get us in to stabilize. You know, we got to survive the next till the 1st of, of July on this budget. We got to then have a path forward. And threading the needle is going to be incredibly difficult because you're going to have to have Democrats vote for budget cuts. You're going to have to have Republicans vote for tax increases. You're going to have to have pro-labor people probably vote for business uh, regulation changes and you're probably going to have to have business people uh, go for minimum wage. I mean, if you're going to put all of this together, it's doable, but it is an incredibly complicated. Right. Uh, and we still have a re- new Republican governor and a, uh, overly, uh, a largely Democratic legislature. Sure. And they were, you know, certainly the parties yeah. were at odds during the Very, recent campaign. But uh, uh, the Democrats, the Democrat, Collerton, Senate President Collerton, Speaker Madigan, I don't think want two years from now to have Bruce Rauner and his money running against the do-nothing obstructionist Democratic legislature. So you think they will be it's, able to reach a bargain? It's not that the governor doesn't have leverage, but this could, you know, this could crash and burn. Interesting. Uh, we will see. I should or could mention at this point. Uh, there has been talk during the last session, and Senator Andy Menar of Bunker Hill, south of Springfield and Macoupin County, is revising a. Uh, legislation that would change the the funding formula to distribute the way the state money in education gets distributed so because he says that over time what has eroded in 17 years since it's been changed is uh, the the poorer schools are not getting as much money as necessary and some of the richer districts are are getting too much but of course the richer districts particularly in the suburbs screamed uh, holy terror about this uh, during the last election cycle so he is changing that to say well cost of living in an area like an expensive area like Chicago or the suburbs may yield more in the formula there he's going to try to rerun the formula and see if they can update that system any any chance of that happening this year or is that just too controversial along with everything else you know, it just seems to me that part of the problem with it with his proposal is it doesn't really change the way it doesn't change the pie at all it's just cutting the pie up in a different way yeah, and you if, if you talk what he says is it doesn't make any sense to add more money to the pie until you know, you cut it up in a better way. But well, no, that's, that's, and that's, and that's fair. Yeah. But the, the, what, what the danger is here is that if you, don't fund, if you don't say, okay, here's light at the end of the tunnel right now, because right now we, it, it's so, so, it relies so much on the property taxes as, as compared with other states to fund education. It's an over-reliance on property tax due to the state not meeting probably its obligations to provide more money in the first place. And so I think, again, Meeks raises a good argument. We need to add a little bit more, more money to that pie before we can start talking about this redistribution formula that, that Menard's talking about. I don't know that they can either one can occur in a vacuum. We will see where it goes. Interesting time in Springfield, of course. Uh, this is the first time in 12 years we've had a transition in governor's office from one party to the other. Um, I think many of us know people who have gotten their notices uh, and may already have left their jobs because the Rauner administration uh, coming in, you know, people who are protected by anti-patronage rules, known as Route 10, can stay in their jobs, administration to administration. But there are like 2,900 of about 50,000 or so state jobs that are considered high enough level that the new administration can take people out and bring their own people in. They haven't 
there's probably been hundreds there you know we don't know how many it's not all of these people who have been fired some have been fired and come back but we do have you know new directors uh, we just uh, within the last couple of days. We had Linda Lingle uh, has been announced by Bruce Rauner. She's a former Republican governor of Hawaii as the chief operating officer of state government. Apparently she did good things in her state according to Bruce Rauner and we'll be able to bring some of that expertise here. Uh, Corey Job is an alderman in Springfield and we have found out uh, that he will be the state director of tourism which is an interesting thing that at least does put a spotlight on Springfield as a, a tourist location because it is a statewide office uh, and he's been working for the Comptroller's office so he's transitioning into the tourism job which by the end of the session he will be full-time there uh, and then there's a, a, a new chief of staff to Mrs. Rahner, Diana Rahner, who is Sarah uh, Wojcicki Jimenez who is a member of the Park Board in Springfield not running for a second term but she looks like she'll have a busy job working for the First Lady. Thoughts? Well, I mean, my first thought, this is the second person on the Springfield Park Board that has now gone to work for the Rauner administration. First, we had Grant Hammer. I mean, and Same. so there must be something about the Springfield Park District that is, there, that is an amazing way to run a government because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, what, there's seven people on the Park Board? Five? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, pretty soon there'll be a majority of the Park Board and running, you know, working well, for... Like she's not running for re-election this spring, so... Okay, well, well for, <laughs> I mean, she, my she thoughts... she has twins, yeah. so... My thoughts on it is, is, is that, you know, I find it incongruous, frankly, that a guy that runs his campaign, I wear an $18 watch, I run a beat-up, I drive a beat-up van, I wear bad Carhartts and bad Dickies, polyester, khaki pants, you know, everywhere I go, and now I'm going to spend six figures for a chief of staff for my wife. Uh, I mean, I didn't vote... I didn't vote for, for Diane Rauner, neither did you, or neither did anybody in this room, and neither right. did anybody in this state. Yeah, well, and, the Associated Press did report that her salary will be $100,000. That's fine. And, and uh, John O'Connor, who wrote the story, put in the story that other first ladies uh, ha have had, you know, chiefs of staff or staff that in similar ways. So we range. should emulate folks that went to prison? I mean, or, or whose spouses <laughs> went to prison, let me, let me say. I mean, here's, the, here's what the issue is. I mean, he came, he said he was going to shake up Springfield. He said he was going to not bring in folks who aren't, who aren't insiders. He's going to fundamentally change the way he does business and then he does this and so the the point is is that he's painted well, another among the points is he's been painting this picture of the sky is falling worse than any of us could possibly have imagined that it was falling the first thing he did after the election was say it's way worse than I ever imagined and then he spends six figures on a chief of staff for his wife which portends that she's actually going to have a staff and so I just find that they're you know personally and I think that there's uh, this feeling look if he fixes the government fine all this is going to be fine and it's going to be a really minor bump on the road if he runs into problems and and he may well run into problems. I mean, this is going to be something that folks can point to, saying, you see, this is just a guy that has the trappings of office and, and, and got carried away with himself. Well, it is interesting. I mean, many of us know Sarah because she... Oh, she's a good person. She, I'm not, she's, this is not an attack on her. She used to be uh, on Channel 20 as a reporter in Springfield, went into politics and became uh, spokesperson for uh, mm -hmm. Tom Cross when he was the, the head of House Republicans. Mm -hmm. So, you not know, a she, slam she knows on her at the all. system. Not a slam on her at all. Yeah, can, how, yeah. how are... Are, are these, you know, I guess we'll be picking any budget, we'll, we'll get these things. Well, I mean, yeah, if you fix the budget, then nothing matters, none of this will matter. If you can't fix the budget, none of this will matter. And so there's a, there's a sense, you know, that, that is part of the reality. It is very difficult to staff up state government, particularly if you're not transitioning from a Republican administration to a Republican administration. And so there is, you know, this is an incredibly difficult task, uh, particularly if you're saying, I'm not going to rely on insiders or you have to go back at least 12 years to get somebody that's worked in state government. So, uh, you know, it is, it is hard to do this. Uh, there's a danger in getting too many layers, you know, so if you've got uh, a chief of staff and a chief operating officer and, you know, and, and you put too much bureaucracy together to run a bureaucracy, you have problems. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think this is difficult. And, and there's also, you know, he's constantly going to be battling this perception problem that, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, that I'm going to shake things up, we're going to do things differently. Uh, and yet we keep running into these, you know, we just had a story today about the governor said, all my money's going in a blind trust. Today we're reading in the Chicago Tribune, it isn't in a blind trust. And, yeah. and so 
the governor, you know, he set some very high standards and, you know, he's done a bunch of things on ethics with the ex executive order. I'm, you know, my, my rules are t for state employees are tougher than they are for legislators or constitutional officers. Right. And, you know, you have to m get up to that bar. Okay, well, the, tri the Tribune story by, I think, I think Bob Sector, who years ago was here for the Sun-Times in Springfield, on the blind trust thing was um, that it, it acts like a blind trust, but a true blind trust where you have no idea what your holdings are may not meet s state regulation because you have to like put what your holdings are on your on your disclosure form. Bruce, you, or, well, or, you know, or Andy, <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> Look, I mean, Bruce Rauner uh, graduated summa cum laude from Dartmouth, then got an MBA from Harvard. He knows what a blind trust is. And to go around and saying I have a blind trust when that's fundamentally not true, what he's got is an investment advisor, more or less. I mean, it's someone who has power of attorney, but there power can be of attorney. power of attorney. Yeah. There can be communication going back and forth. That is so far. That that's as far from a blind trust as we are from Hawaii. And so, my w that's the third sort of whiff that he's made. I think in fundamentally telling an untruth to people, it's not a blind trust. When he told you that he had cl hadn't clouded, hadn't talked to Arnie Duncan or, or about his daughter, that was untrue. His well, flip -flop based, based on another statement he right, made, right? Right. But what we've got is this guy that is very fast and. I think with the truth here when it comes to pretty easy concepts. He and, and it's, I, I think, it, perhaps it is a function of, of uh, being still somewhat of a newcomer to, to politics and sort of this ramped up level of scrutiny. That That's a possibility, but as, as you sort of indicate, it is becoming easier for uh, uh, folks like us to sort of point out and say, well, you said you called Speaker Madigan and Senate President Cullerton right mm -hmm. after the election, yeah. but, but, but you not, yeah, we're not well, quite. He, he had said that during this, the campaign, too. This is, yeah. a, this is a, a, a blind trust, but not, not quite. And so, Do, well, you know, it, it was obviously an expensive campaign. Obviously, people were unhappy with the way things were going in Illinois. Do people in the public really care about this? Because truly, I hear a lot of people say they are hopeful that despite the problems, despite the rough campaign, they are looking forward to, you know, maybe a new day in some ways in state government, maybe getting rid of some of the stuff that shouldn't be happening. Maybe, you know, he keeps talking about no connected people and less patronage and, uh, you know, paring down unnecessary spending. I think everybody hopes for that, and that's okay. why this is so disappointing, is because that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping for somebody to t come in and do what he said he's going to do, and turn things around and start telling the truth about stuff. And when you can't tell the truth about whether you have a blind trust or not, when you can't tell the truth about whether you talked to Cullerton the night of your election or not, when you can't tell the truth about whether you clouded your daughter into a school or not, I mean, none of these are in and of themselves very important, and even collectively they're not important. The problem is, is that we're just waiting. We're in this waiting pose about what is he going to do? Yeah. Is he going to be able to pull it off? And we're seeing these things and they just don't look good. And it's bad politics. And besides everything else, I mean, you know, if you say, I'm setting up a financial arrangement that has, you know, some of the elements of a blind trust, but this is why we can't do it that way, then it's a one day story. If you say, we have, a, yeah. we have a blind trust and then people print that and you don't put out a, a press release or a statement that says, well, it's not really a blind trust. You have to wait until it shows up on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. Then, you know, that's just not smart politics and it reinforces the public's narrative that anytime somebody gets in office, they all of us be behave the same way. It doesn't really matter. Mm. We don't trust politicians. Politics corrupts people. And, you know, if you're going to change the culture, then you've got to sacrifice. You've got to pay the price. And we'll see whether he's willing to do that. Okay. Um, something just popped into my head. Wayne Rosenthal, who is a state representative from Morrisonville, Central Illinois, uh, has been named by the governor to be director of the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, Wayne's a farmer. He has a game reserve. Um, some, there's a, I know there's a Sun-Times outdoors writer who doesn't like this appointment because he thought Wayne is not a professional environmentalist or, or uh, outdoor conservationist. But, um, but it's also, like Rich Miller of Capital Effects noted, uh, this would generate good feelings with the legislature to show that one of their own could be named to a position. And Wayne Rosenthal, I mean, those of us who know him, a fine person. Any thoughts on that appointment and how easy that will sail through the Senate? Well, I no, I think that it's going to going to sail through the Senate and making appointments where you get a farmer to head up agriculture and you know those sorts of things you you know you're reinforcing some of the the constituencies uh, but you're still having come in and said no more business as usual then 
you know, you, you, you're always balancing, you feel yin and yang. It's the CEO from, from Hawaii and there, or the, chi, the COO oh, oh, from, right. from Hawaii, and then it's the, the local legislator, the local legislator yeah. who's a farmer. And so, you know, it, Well, he it, hunts. Yeah. And, and in fact, he sponsored the bobcat hunting bill, which, you know, may get resurrected and Ron or may approve because Quinn vetoed it. But does yeah. he dig for coal? And that's actually, you know, that's a large function of what DNR does. That's I mean, true. it gets all the, the you know, the, the, the hunting and the fishing gets a lot of the attention. But I'm going to be really interested to see what happens on the environmental side, because I think Ron has leaned very, indicated very strongly he's going to take a, a very pro-business approach to uh, regulating coal companies who have supported him, at least uh, in his inauguration, not so much during his campaign. Well, and obviously, uh, is it is it DNR or EPA, and I'm, I should know this, but fracking, uh, you know, we, Illinois has a law and has regulations, and Southern Illinois is ripe to, you know, get moving on these things. And the impression always was that Bruce Rauner would be much more open to get this business rolling. Fracking than would be under was. DNR, to my understanding. Yeah. It's under Office so, of Mines so and Minerals. So there you go. Which has had some tremendous issues uh, uh, historically. I mean, uh, uh, Quinn, uh, quote unquote, cleaned house or announced some reforms last year, which is still have not uh, come to pass. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens, among other things, with this promised revamp of permitting processes in DNR for coal mines, among other things. I mean, that's not a done deal yet. And so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, plays out. It will indeed. I am not probably going to open this one up to comments because we have a feisty crew, but <laughs> Bruce Rauner was involved in downtown Chicago. His motorcade was stopped at a red light. There was an accident at the intersection and a car uh, apparently, not horribly, but uh, did, did hit the governor's car. Nobody in the his entourage was hurt. A couple of people were taken to the hospital in the other car. We wish the governor well. Uh, we, know, we, we know he has to spend some time in Chicago, and we, he has talked about the restaurants and other uh, venues he's visited in Springfield, so we'll look for him more around here as well. With that, it's about our time. Uh, Kent Redfield, Bruce Rushton, Andy Maloney, thanks for your help and your comments. I'm Bernie Schoenberg, and thank you. We'll see you next time on Capital View.